information tape. All right, let's get into the Word. 1 Samuel chapter 14. I'm going to say it again. I know you're tired of me saying this, but this is a great chapter. Of course, you know, when I said that last week, it was the same chapter, so I'm just reiterating it. Uh, great chapter, rich uh, chapter, so much here, and really looking forward to what the Lord has for us. Now, last week, for those of you who were here, uh, we ended actually the last 30 minutes of the Bible study with a video uh, that we showed uh, titled Miracle at Michmash, and it was from the documentary series Against All Odds, Israel Survives. It's an amazing documentary, and uh, it in this particular episode was a uh, documented account of two miraculous victories, all, both of which had taken place at the same exact spot, uh, the first of which was uh, in 1 Samuel 14, our text tonight, actually uh, verses 4 through 23, which is all the further we're going to get uh, tonight, but I better hurry up actually. So, uh, But there was actually a second battle that took place here, and really a second miracle, uh, because of 1 Samuel 14 uh, in 1917, when uh, one of the uh, soldiers read the account in 1 Samuel 14 during World War I, and uh, because of it, they were victorious, and as such, liberated Jerusalem. It's recorded in the British war journals of World War I, uh, it took place in 1917, more specifically December 9th, 1917, which some believe was the fulfillment to the exact day of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 12, verse 12, the 1335-day prophecy. Others believe that it's a literal day and that the 1335 days of Daniel 12 is possibly... Uh, a prophecy about the period of judgment for those who survive the tribulation period when they stand before God. Uh, what do I think? Uh, yes. <laughs> we'll find out uh, maybe very soon. So uh, be that as it may, for tonight, I want us to redirect our attention to this battle here in 1 Samuel 14. We're going to pick it up in verse 4. But before we do, let's uh, go to the throne and pray and ask God's blessing on our time in His Word. Lord, thank You. Thank You for Your Word, Lord. Thank You for this church building that we get to use on Thursday nights and meet together and open up our Bibles and freely study your word and worship you and learn of you and fellowship together and just be together in this place. Lord, many of us are here tonight after a pretty gnarly week and just all the stress, the cares, the affairs and the busyness of the day. But this place represents for us a sanctuary, a place, a meeting place where you meet us here and speak to us here and minister to us here through your word. So Lord, that's what we're asking you to do tonight. Will you speak to us, speak into our lives by the Holy Spirit? Show us what you want us to see. Give us ears to hear that which you would desire to speak. We want to leave here tonight, Lord, just knowing that there's been a transaction with you, interaction with you, that there's been a word fitly spoken from you, that needs are met because of you tonight. So, Lord, we're just going to submit ourselves to you quiet our hearts before you and ask you to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 4. Now keep in mind, <clears throat> Jonathan and his armor bearer are wanting to attack this other garrison or stronghold of the Philistines. And so they're really sort of seeking the Lord as to whether or not it's his will, which we're going to see 
uh, more tonight. So we're told in verse 4, between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bazez, and the name of the other, Sana. The front, verse 5, of one faced northward opposite Michmash, and the other southward opposite Gibeah. Uh, interesting detail. Why the detail? Well, it's because the Holy Spirit wants us to know how that Jonathan has discovered this narrow pathway. And it happens to be through these two sharp rocks on both sides. You might remember from the video last week, the actual spot. You have this valley in between and these steep cliffs with sharp rocks on both sides. And it appears that the Lord has supernaturally shown Jonathan this narrow, almost secret pathway or passageway by which to access the camp of the Philistines. And even in the video, there was this mention of it having to be divine guidance in the sense that God would have had to supernaturally guide Jonathan in order for him to discover this narrow, interesting, narrow uh, passageway. And I'm of the belief that God did that. God showed him this supernaturally, even miraculously, guided him to this because he knew that he was willing to go. He knew Jonathan's heart. That it was not okay for Jonathan. Apparently it was okay for his father, King Saul, to have the Philistines just set up these garrisons, these strongholds, anywhere they want, any time they want, on land belonging to Israel. And so it seems that Saul and the Israelites had sort of acquiesced to and sort of resigned themselves to the reality that, you know, they have to be, you know, submitted to the Philistines, especially in light of the fact that their army, we're told, is so massive, so numerous, you can't even count it. The numbers, that of the sands on the seashore, and clearly the Israelites are outnumbered. We're told that Saul only has 600 men left with him. The others ran and hide. Some even crossed back over the Jordan because they were so afraid of this massive Philistine army. And then here's Jonathan. He only has one guy with him, his armor bearer, two, (laughs) Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they're going to take on this massive Philistine army. But what I find very interesting is because Jonathan was willing to do this, God would direct his steps. Let me uh, explain this. I'm learning in my own walk with the Lord as it relates to the guidance of the Lord, when God is guiding your steps, directing your paths, that God will not be party to my disobedience. And here's what I mean by that. He will and may, out of necessity, withhold guidance he knows I have no intention of following. He will not give me that divine guidance, that direction. He will not direct my steps if he knows that I'm not going to follow his lead. Because to do so would, in effect, mean that he was party to my disobedience. He knows that I'm not going to obey his leading or follow his lead. You know, sometimes God will not tell us what the next thing to do is because we weren't obedient to do the last thing he led us to do. So with Jonathan, God is supernaturally showing him this because he knows that Jonathan will do it. He has every intention of following the Lord's lead. And that's why this divine guidance came 
vis-a-vis -vis the upright integrity of his heart. And I say it that way for a reason, in that God knew he had the character and the integrity to do that which he would show him to do. And that's why he showed him this narrow pathway. This is Proverbs 11.3. Very interesting uh, proverb, by the way. It's been one that over the years has been very instrumental both in my business uh, experience and even in ministry, especially in ministry. But it goes like this. The integrity of the upright guides them. Did you catch that? In other words, if you have the integrity and you're upright, then God in turn will guide you accordingly. But conversely, listen, the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity, their wishy-washy duplicity back and forth, double-minded, unstable in all of their ways, James says. In other words, if I'm duplicious, disingenuous, I can't hope that God will guide my steps. You know that proverb 3, 5, and 6? We sing it. We all have it committed to memory. We have it in calligraphy on our walls. We have it in our wallpaper. You know, you know, it, Acknowledge the Lord in all your, your ways. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then he will make your path straight. He will direct your paths. Kind of misses the, uh, the whole meaning of it. Because it carries with it the idea of he'll kind of straighten it out. He'll, he'll show you that narrow, straight pathway. He'll, he'll guide you to it, but it's conditional. What do you mean? It's, it requires, it's predicated on first that I don't lean on my own understanding. And second, that I acknowledge him in all of my ways. And by the way, when is it that I acknowledge him in all of my ways? When I don't understand. See, if I do understand, and I'm leaning on my understanding, then I'm probably not going to acknowledge him, let alone trust in him with all my heart. When do I trust in him with all my heart? When I don't have understanding and I can't lean on that understanding and I can't trust in that understanding. So I have to go to him, acknowledge him, trust in him, ask him to guide me <laughs> in, this, in the way that I should go. This is the way walk ye in it. But if I don't have any, if I'm just kind of taking the temperature, you know, and well, I just want to, you know, see what, you know, I'm just kind of curious, you know, what, what God would have me to do. And, and if he guides me in a direction that I really don't want to go, well then, you know, so listen, God isn't going to show you what to do. He's not going to call you to do that. Isaiah 26, 7 says, The way of the just is uprightness. O most upright, you weigh the path of the just. And that's what God is doing here with Jonathan. He's not only showing him the path, he's weighing the path because of Jonathan's uprightness. Verse 6, Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come. Let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. I find that interesting. It reminds me of David, who would never call Goliath by his name. It's an interesting detail uh, in, in the account of David and Goliath. He'll never address him as Goliath. You can search the, the narrative. You'll never find him once calling him Goliath. Uh, you know what Goliath means? Champion. To David, this is no champion. To David, this is an uncircumcised Philistine who is blaspheming the name of his God. And so too is this true with Jonathan. These are uncircumcised Philistines that are blaspheming the name of our God. So he says, it may be, now this is interesting, watch this. It may be that the Lord will work for us. He doesn't know yet. 
For nothing, but listen to this, restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. In other words, if it is the Lord, they're toast. Verse 7, so his armor bearer said to him, are you crazy? No, he doesn't say that. (laughs) I would have said that. If I'm his armor bearer, I would have thought, you know, Jonathan, let's just take this really slow here, okay? Let's, Let's do the math here, okay? It's Let's see, let's count you and me. Okay, now let's count the, the Philistine. Oh, oh, that's right, we can't count them. There's too many to count. So he doesn't say that. He says, do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you according to to your heart. I like this guy. I like the music to Jonathan's ears. Now, please don't imagine this armor bearer, you know, just carrying Jonathan's armor like a golf caddy, you know, carrying the, that was pretty weird, but it's, that's a great word picture though. That's not at all. He was the right hand man. He was extremely skilled militarily. And so this is Jonathan's you know, right-hand guy. And what an encouragement to Jonathan to have his armor bearer say, hey, man, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. Let's do it. If the Lord is putting this on your heart, the Lord is leading you in this direction, then I'm with you all the way. I think about when uh, Ruth said to her mother-in-law, you know what? I'm with you, man. I'm with you all the way. Your God is my God. Most, most beautiful passage in all of the Bible about the loyalty that she had to her mother-in-law, the loyalty that this armor bearer has for Jonathan and to Jonathan. I think of Esther who said, you know, if I perish, I perish. And, and I, and I, I kind of wonder if this armor bearer is thinking the same thing. You know what? <laughs> I'm with you. If we die, hey, what a way to go, you know? (laughs) But I'm with you all the way. You know, loyalty is kind of a rare thing these days, you know? And uh, I was sharing with somebody about how in the Arab culture, uh, you know, just in our DNA, we have this loyalty to death as Arabs. And it's somewhat true in the... Hebrew culture as well, even to to modern day. Someone was telling me uh, a couple weeks ago after uh, uh, Sunday uh, service about how they went and saw this movie. I don't know the name of the movie, but um, it was about an Afghanistan, uh, one of our military uh, guys in Afghanistan that actually had an Afghani save his life from the Taliban, his own people, because of the loyalty that he had for this American uh, soldier. And that is a cultural dynamic, by the way. See, when, when an Arab, uh, you know, breaks bread with you, you're loyal till death because that, that person has given you bread to eat, food to eat, and, and water to drink. And in effect, they have saved your life. See, in the ancient you know, uh, culture, the Arabs particularly were a Bedouin people. They were nomadic. They would travel long distances for long periods of time. And whenever they would come upon a tent and someone would take them in, give them water to drink and food to eat, they in effect saved their life. And so now they're loyal till death because you saved my life, see? That's why in the culture today, uh, a, a covenant is made by breaking bread together. Remember in 1993 when uh, then-President Clinton had Arafat and uh, Rabin on the White House lawn signing the Oslo Peace Accords, and all they did was shake hands? It meant absolutely nothing. That, that's not how they do it. If, if they would have sat down and broke bread together, that's it. They're loyal till death. They would have kept that, that covenant. It means absolutely nothing. And that's why. 
It's because of the loyalty that they have. And that's why to this day the Arab people particularly are so hospitable. Uh, I remember as a kid growing up, my, my mom would say when we go over to you know, the family and they put a plate, you eat everything on that plate. Because if you leave anything on that plate, it is an offense and they get insulted. Like you don't like the food. And, and so culturally it is you know, a very great shame to not eat everything that is put in front of you. Does that, uh, that explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> right? That's my excuse. So I just, I'm, that, I'm sticking with that one. That's my story. So, but anyway, so, you know, it, because it, it's, it's so cultural when you eat together, there's this loyalty, this bond that takes place. And here's this armor bearer of Jonathan who has this loyalty, but he's also displaying this remarkable faith. I mean, not only is Jonathan displaying this remarkable faith, but the armor bearer, think about this, is displaying a remarkable faith, not just in the Lord, but in Jonathan, his leader, who he's willing to put his faith in and his trust in and, and follow into this battle. Here's what I'm thinking. Jonathan is putting feet to his faith. Maybe I can say it this way. He's putting his faith where his mouth is. And so is his armor bearer. And it's evidenced by his unflinching fearlessness to move forward in spite of all of the odds that are just insurmountable, really impossible. See, I believe Jonathan knew that faith without action, faith by itself, it's, it's nothing. It's dead. It has to be accompanied by action. Our faith has to be accompanied by the action to step out in faith, put feet to our faith. It's as if Jonathan would say, you might show me your faith without deeds, but I'll show you my faith but." by what I'm willing to actually do. The scriptures are replete with this, are they not? Exhortations to put our faith where our feet are, so to speak, and take action. Consider James 2, 17 and 18. I know you know this verse. In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do, the action I take, the step out in faith that I take. James 2, 26 says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You really got to think about Jonathan's faith here. And I believe it, it was his faith that so pleased God. Listen to Hebrews 4 too. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them. Nothing happened. And here's why. It was because those who heard did not combine it with faith. They did not take the next step, take action, and combine it with faith. In other words, faith has to be combined with, accompanied by action. Otherwise, it's nothing. It's not faith. It's dead. K.P. Ohanan, founder of Gospel for Asia, wrote a book, really a booklet in his journey series. I really encourage you. This, it's such, the whole series is just fabulous. But this one uh, is living by faith, not by sight. And listen to this illustration. It's so just perfect. He says... There's a chemistry to take place. For example, 
when hydrogen is mixed with oxygen in the presence of heat, a chemical reaction takes place and water is produced. Two separate elements, when combined, mixed, yield an entirely different result than if they were never mixed. And this is true in life as well. There's a chemistry that needs to occur in our lives in what we see, hear, and know being mixed with faith. You may have needs or promises from God, but if they are never mixed or combined with the element of faith, you will never see the reaction or action take place to bring those to fruition. See, Jonathan has mixed the two, and the result will be not only the fruition, but the victory coming miraculously because of it. You know, I wonder sometimes, and this is not to produce guilt or condemnation or anything, but even in my own life, I wonder how many things was God wanting to do in and through my life but was unable to do it because I didn't have the faith. And I didn't combine or mix the faith with action. And so here this grand and glorious thing that God wanted to do in and through my life, use me, and he couldn't because... I tied the ropes of his miraculous power, hit the hands of his miraculous power with the ropes of my unbelief, my lack of faith, my unwillingness to put feet to my faith. Here's another thought with respect to Jonathan's armor bearer. He's trusting in the Lord and in Jonathan, but they're both walking by faith and not by sight. Understand, sight is the antithesis of faith. Faith being defined as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, very strong word, of that which is yet unseen. In other words, it's already a done deal. I just don't have it tangibly by sight yet. So I'm going to walk by faith with the hope that that which I have the evidence of yet unseen will come to fruition. That's faith. And that's walking by faith. But here's the problem. Everything within my sin nature, that Adamic nature, everything within me fights that. Because I want to walk by sight. Walking by faith requires that I... Trust God, <laughs> right? Wow, we don't want to do that. No, I, if I don't see, I got, I've got to trust Him who does see, who sees the end from the beginning, who knows the end from the beginning. And so I have to put my faith in Him, walk by faith, trusting Him. And that's what they're doing here. And it's really important to understand that they have not yet received their marching orders, if you will. There's still ambiguity here. They really don't know if God is going to deliver the Philistines into their hands yet. They're still seeking the Lord one step at a time. Heretofore, they've only followed God's divine guidance supernaturally up to this point. We're off to a good start. God is leading us as we round each corner. The first thing that tells me that this may be the Lord wanting to deliver us is He showed us that narrow passageway. Well, let's start moving in that direction then. Let's follow the lead. This looks like it's the Lord. So let's keep going. Let's keep walking in this way by faith, one step at a time. And let's see now as we round the next corner by faith where He's going to lead. We're going to see in the next verses that Jonathan is going to inquire of the Lord as to whether or not God will, in fact, grant them the victory before he goes into battle. But this is significant 
at this juncture for a couple of reasons, chief of which is that Jonathan knows by faith that God is the one that is going to have to do this for them and instead of them. And we see that when he says whether it's a few or many, if God's going to deliver them into our hands, then we have nothing to worry about. It's, in other words, it's not us, my dear loyal armor bearer. This is going to be the Lord. In other words, Jonathan is in no way trusting in his own strength. And make no mistake about it, Jonathan is strong. But he knows that this will not come by might or by power, but by the Spirit says the Lord, Zechariah 4, 6. If this victory is to come, it's going to have to be God. There's no way in and of ourselves, in our own strength, that we could ever hope to have this victory. And here's the thing. And, and notice this with me. There's not one time where you're going to see Jonathan ask the Lord to bless his plan to attack the Philistines. We do that, don't we? Well, maybe I should just speak for myself. I do that, okay? You're more spiritual than me. I, I, you know, I lay out my plan before the Lord, and I say, okay, Lord, bless this. <laughs> and I just, I imagine God in heaven looking at my measly, just puny little, you know, man-made plan in and of my own strength and savvy. And he just looks at him and he goes, really? You want me to bless this? Why don't you just let me do it? No, but Lord, just, you know, bless this. And, and the Lord's saying, I, I don't want to bless that. It's, that's your plan. I want you to do what my plan is. <laughs> oh, maybe I should have asked you, Lord, what, what do you, you want to do. I mean, here I am, I'm strategizing, I'm figuring it out, I'm plotting, I'm planning, and, and the Lord's just going, wow, well, when you're done, would you just let me know, and I'll give you the battle plan here, and the victory, too. Do this, try this. I, it's not for wimps, by the way. Listen to what your prayer requests are. Lord, bless this, bless that, bless, you know, bless, bless, and we're just, it's just, we're just asking God to bless our plans, bless our desires. Did it ever dawn on us that maybe we need to say, Lord, <laughs> unless you do this for me instead of me, uh, then you might as well just shoot me now because <laughs> this is how it is. And so he's seeking the Lord. He's seeking the will of the Lord. And I think it's for this reason that God is going to grant Jonathan the victory. He could trust Jonathan with the victory. See, Jonathan knew that God plus one was a majority in spite of all the odds. And he also knew that God plus one meant the victory. And when he says that whether by few or by many, I think he knows what Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 30 says. How could one man chase a thousand or two put 10,000 to flight unless... Their rock, and that's capitalized, I'll give you one guess who that is, had sold them unless the Lord had given them up. In other words, unless the Lord gives up the Philistines and delivers them, there's no other way that two, Jonathan and his armor bearer, can put the multitude, this massive army, of the Philistines to flight, which they're about to do, by the way. This is Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, that's a nice verse. We memorize it, we quote it, we sing it, right? But think about what that really says. 
if, let's stop right there with that big if word. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Isaiah, speaking of Israel, says, no war weapon forged against thee shall prosper. They don't stand a chance. It doesn't matter few or many. That's not what matters. What matters is if God is for you, then nobody can prevail against you or over you. God is for Jonathan. God is for Jonathan. The implication of both these verses in Deuteronomy and then in Romans is that God is looking for the Jonathans. Wouldn't you agree? If, if God is for me, doesn't that imply that God is looking for Jonathans to be for? To go before and to be for? To be strong on their behalf? Is that not 2 Chronicles 16, 9? When the prophet comes to King Asa and warns him on the heels of a miraculous victory against the army of the Ethiopians, one million strong. One million. And he has the victory and the prophet goes to him and says, don't let that go to your head. That's a very loose paraphrase, but <laughs> don't think for a second that you accomplish that victory in and of your own strength. For don't you know that the eyes of the Lord search to and fro looking for hearts fully devoted to Him, fully relying upon Him. Why? So that He can be strong on their behalf. In other words, and we're going to talk about this Sunday, I can't wait, in our study in 1 Corinthians, when we're weak, then we're strong. Because see, when we're weak, as Paul would boast, it's only then in our weakness that we have to rely fully and only upon the Lord whose eyes are searching to and fro throughout the earth looking for Jonathan's, looking for David's, men whose hearts are fully committed, fully devoted, fully relying upon him so that he can be strong on their behalf. Go before them, be for them, and give the victory to them. I love what one commentator said. It was not Jonathan that was to work with some help from God. It was the Lord that was to work by, and might I add, before Jonathan. I'm convinced that God searches. He looks for men and women like Jonathan, whom he can use to do extraordinary things, miraculous things. The prerequisite, though, is that their hearts are fully committed to Him, trusting in Him, and by faith, willing to take action and do it. Verse 8, then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But, verse 10, if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. Wow. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm the armor bearer. I'm like, okay, so let me see if I got this straight, Jonathan. What you're saying is we're going to reveal ourselves to them. We're going to say, hi, Philistines. <laughs> and if they say in, in turn, hey, Hey, stay right there. We're, we're coming down. Don't, don't move. Okay? The Lord's not going to deliver them. Okay? Into our hands. However, if instead they say, Hey, Israelites, come on up. <laughs> then we're going up because the Lord has delivered them into our hands. 
You know, now the, <laughs> the armor bearer, he's trusting the Lord, right? And he's trusting Jonathan's leadership. And, you know, but, you know, I wonder if he's thinking, are you sure about this, Jonathan? Because, I mean, are you really sure about this? Because are you really, really sure? No, I'm not sure. That's why we're going to seek the Lord to see if we can be sure if this is the Lord's will. This is great faith. This is, see, I would rather be like Saul sometimes, as we'll see in a moment, just kind of sitting and praying, Lord, you know, let lightning strike and just kill the Philistine army. That would be really easy and quick, right? But not Jonathan. Jonathan's like, hey, let me at him. Let's see if the Lord's in this and if he's going to deliver us or not. See, again, he doesn't yet have the confirmation. He's seeking the confirmation as to whether or not this is God's will, and he's giving God the elbow room to reveal it and even confirm it. And again, he's walking by faith one step at a time, and he's following what he believes to be the Lord leading him up to this point. And he's going to take it to the next level, as it were, now, it's interesting because some have suggested that Jonathan is doing the same thing that Gideon did. Remember back in Judges chapter 6 when he set out the fleece? You know, Lord, I just need confirmation if this is really you. You know, so the, you know, he puts the fleece out and let the dew be on the fleece and not on the ground. So then God's like, all right, whatever. So he you know, puts the, well, probably not like that, but... I would have done it like that. But he made the fleece with the dew and then the ground. And then here's Gideon, right? This great man of faith, right? He's like, okay, I just want to be really, 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 really sure. So now let's have the, you know, dew be on the ground, but not on the fleece. And God's like, okay. So he puts the dew on the ground, but not on the fleece. And then Gideon is still reluctant. Is that what Jonathan is doing here? Absolutely not. What's the difference? Well, now think this through with me. The difference between the two is that Gideon already had the direct command of the Lord to go and deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Midianites, 135,000 strong. And you know the story, right? He, has a, he starts off with 32,000 men, and then God says to Gideon, you got way too many guys. And Gideon's response, really, if you'd done the math, 32,000, 135,000, you mean they have too many guys. No, 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 you have too many guys. I got to get you down to like Jonathan and his armor bearer, two against, you know, countless. And he gets 300, ends up with 300. See, Gideon already had all the confirmation you need. I mean, when God just, you know, appears to you and speaks to you and says, oh, mighty man of valor, you know, I'm going to deliver the Midianites into your hands. Uh, that's pretty clear. That's like Red Sea clear, right? You know what I mean by Red Sea clear? You know, the Israelites have just made the exodus out of Egypt and, and the Egyptians are following them and, and they come to the, you know, shores of the Red Sea and the Egyptians are hot on their tail and, and then they see them and they start freaking out and and they, you know, start complaining to Moses, just the beginning of the complaining. And what, God couldn't just kill us in Egypt? He had to bring us out here to kill us? What, were there not enough gravestones in Egypt for all of us? Why do you have to bring us out here? I mean, this is it. This is how it ends. And then, so, then God says, okay, Moses, put your staff. And, you know, he parts the Red Sea. And the, here's dry ground. And, you know, if I'm an Israelite, I'm looking at this. And I got the, the Egyptians behind me certain death, and, and God's even got a pillar of fire keeping them from getting to me, and then he's, he's parted the Red Sea and made dry ground for me to walk this narrow path. That's pretty clear that it's God's will that I go this direction. You know, I mean, it, that's what I mean by Red Sea clear. <laughs> this is the way walking in it. Uh, okay, that's, that's the Lord. That's pretty good confirmation right there for me. I'll take it. And I want all the time for God to be that clear, right? It makes it really easy. There's no guessing. Yes, this is the Lord's will. Well, he, Jonathan has no such command. He has not had God say to him, go. He's had God 
lead him, but he has not had God confirm it to him yet as to whether or not he's to proceed. Well, that's coming, verse 11. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men, verse 12, of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. <laughs> Translated, come up to us and we're going to teach you a lesson. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, you know what that means, don't you? <laughs> come up after me for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Wow. How cool is this? Now, it's important to understand that there was a greater likelihood the Philistines would have said, stay right there, we'll come down. And here's why. They don't want the Israelites up in their camp. I mean, just militarily, that would be stupid. That would be foolish. So there was a greater likelihood that instead of saying, hey, come on up here into our camp, no, there was a greater likelihood they would say, hey, no, stay right there, we'll come down. And to me, this may very well be how Jonathan knew it would be the Lord. I mean, have you ever kind of wondered how it is that these men and women in the Old Testament who were mightily used knew that it was the Lord? I mean, how did Jonathan know that it would be the Lord if they said, come up? I believe it's because it would have been much more difficult. And for them to go up instead of staying down where they were, he knew it was the Lord because the odds were against the Philistines saying, come up here. Here's where I'm going with this. It would have been infinitely more difficult for Jonathan and his armor bearer to go up to the Philistines. It's treacherous, sharp rocks. They're going to climb up a very steep cliff. You saw it in the video. And as we're going to see here momentarily, they have to actually crawl up on their hands and knees through this narrow passageway that, that God has shown them. Uh, by the way, interesting uh, little side note, narrow, not wide, hands and knees, <laughs> that's a very good posture to be in when you're in battle, seeking the Lord, the will of the Lord. But see, here's why I point this out. I think oftentimes we want God to confirm His will by having it be the easier way. You know, I, I want God's will to be the path of least resistance. I, I don't want it to be the harder path. But not Jonathan. See, Jonathan knew that just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's not God's will. And I think oftentimes we do err greatly when we misunderstand the will of God because we go through adversity. You can be right smack in the middle of adversity and still be right smack in the middle of God's will. Verse 13, here it is. Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after them. I wonder, I wonder what the Philistines are doing. <laughs> this is going to be fun. And they fell before Jonathan. What? The Philistines fell? Yeah. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. What? And verse 14, that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. And verse 14, 15, there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and I love this, and the earth quaked. Thank you, God. So that it was a very great trembling. Okay, listen, if there's any doubt that it was the will of the Lord, <laughs> there's no doubt now. 
And if there's any doubt as to why this was the will of the Lord, the earthquake sort of puts all of those doubts to rest. And here's why I say that. God was rewarding Jonathan for diligently seeking him and trusting him by faith to deliver them from the Philistines. This is Hebrews eleven six, one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. Without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know what that means? With faith, it's possible to please God. In other words, God is pleased by our faith. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This was God's reward to Jonathan because he was so pleased by Jonathan's faith. Henry Morris says, An earthquake was apparently timed by God in answer to Jonathan's faith, causing enough fear and confusion in the Philistine garrison to enable Jonathan and his armor bearer to destroy them, partly because the Philistine warriors also began fighting each other. I love it. This is not the only time in Scripture where you see God just bringing this confusion into the camp of the enemy. And so they turn on each other and they actually destroy each other. And this is what happens here. Verse 16, now the watchman of Saul in Gabeah of Benjamin looked and there was the multitude melting away and they went here and there. Then verse 17, Saul said to the people who were with him, now call the roll and see who has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And verse 18, Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. For at that time, the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened, verse 19, while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines, continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Okay, what's going on here? This is really very interesting. I mean, it's almost like the narrative takes us back to, you know, how they, you know, in this storyline, you know, meanwhile, back at the ranch, well, it's like, you know, we're we're taken away from the battlefield with Jonathan and his armor bearer. It's kind of like, meanwhile, back under the shade of the pomegranate tree, That's where Saul's been the whole time. You know, the guys are probably, you know, cooling him with the palms, you know. He's eating the pomegranates from the tree, and you know, you know. (laughs) And his son is over there, you know, risking his life by faith, trusting God for the victory against the Philistines. And, And so Saul learns of it by way of the loud noise from the battlefield and the Philistines melting in fear from an attack. So what's his response? Very interesting. He takes a roll call. Who, who's missing? Somebody went and attacked the Philistines. Who was it? Oh, you have no idea, Saul. (laughs) It was your son and his armor bearer, man. And (laughs) I mean, at, at first glance, you look at this and you think, well, you know, why, why would he, I mean, you, you might think, well, that's kind of shrewd, figure out, you know, who amongst us went out and attacked the Philistines, and, but eh, that wouldn't give him that much uh, credit. And the reason I say that is because of what he does next. It's even more interesting. He uh, asks for the ark of God to be brought to him. Why? He wants to discern via the urim and the thumim, the the breastplate, you know, uh, whether or not this was the Lord or not. Whether or not it was God's will if they join Jonathan and his armor bearer in battle. Now here's the problem with both of these responses on the part of Saul. Outwardly they, they appear spiritual. They have the appearance of being spiritual outwardly, but I would suggest that it may be that he's covering his carnality inwardly. And let me explain how I get there. Saul taking the roll call, finding out who did this without him knowing, 
it's almost as if he was more concerned about whoever it was that led the attack being the one who takes the credit instead of him. Think about it. This, this was a, a shaming. Somebody had the guts to do that which he himself was unwilling to do. Who did this? I should have done they, they showed me up. Well, it was your son who had more courage and more faith and more trust than you did. And by the way, is, this is going to be replayed again with David. For 40 days and 40 nights, he sits not under a pomegranate tree, but under his tent for 40 days and 40 nights. And then here comes David saying, I'm willing to go in and fight this, this uh, uncircumcised Philistine when the king himself is unwilling to. This, this having the ark of God brought to him, again, outwardly it can appear being spiritual. Oh, the king is seeking the Lord. He's having the ark of God and the priests discern the will of the Lord with the Urim and the Thummim. Hey, let's pray about this. There's a problem. God has already made it very clear that it's his will. Uh, Saul, <laughs> with all due respect, stop praying and get moving. And, and he has to, not of his own volition, but he has to when we're told that the noise in the camp kept getting louder. Finally, he realizes, you know what? We probably ought to go and it looks like God's giving us the victory. And so he finally acquiesces and leaves the comfort of his pomegranate tree and all the shade that it had provided and seemingly reluctantly joins the battle now that it looks like the victory is at hand. And that's what we see. And we'll bring the chapter to an end. Verse 20, then Saul, or the study to an end. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor and there was very great confusion. Moreover, verse 21, this is interesting. The Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from that surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, verse 22, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim. These are the guys that r ran and hid in fear from the Philistine army. It's kind of, it's kind of like they, you'll forgive my, the silliness with which I illustrate this, but it's kind of like they come out of hiding and go, what? We're winning? Hold on, let me out, let me out. It's kind of like, <laughs> See, I, really? Don't bother. Just stay there. We don't need you. It's just me. So likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So, verse 23, the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beit Avon. Wow. It's a pathetic way to really end the study, but... Um, I mean, for Saul and all these men who hid in fear to only now join the battle once the victory is at hand, to only then, once they saw that God was going to deliver them into their hands, they come out from hiding. And then, then they take action. That's not faith, that's sight. Right? They, they, that's not faith. They already saw it. They're not walking by faith as Jonathan and his armor bearer did. They're walking by sight. They saw that the Philistines had turned upon each other and there was a great confusion that God was giving them the victory. They saw it. Whereas Jonathan, by faith, trusted in the Lord for it. I'm going to close by simply saying what I think represents everyone here tonight. Don't you want to be a Jonathan? I, I really like this guy. This is, one commentator made the comment that, that he's probably one of the, 
uh, least, um, you know, talked about heroes in the Bible. He doesn't get much press, except, you know, so to speak, right? He doesn't get a lot of coverage. This guy was a man of faith. He's going to become David's very closest and most loyal friend, as we're going to see. They were men of like mind. They were of one mind and one accord. They were both courageous men, men of faith, men who had hearts after God's own hearts. These were men who wouldn't wait for someone else who was willing to boldly trust in the Lord. They're the ones that are standing at the front of the line saying, Lord, here am I, send me. Send me. If you're in this, then show me. Lead me. I will follow. Confirm it for me. Is, are you going to give me the victory in this? I, I have the faith to trust you. I'm willing to take the action, mix it with my faith. Lord, is this you? And I, I just imagine God waiting to hear that. He's on standby. And he'll do everything and stop at nothing to move on behalf of those who are willing to say, Lord, I trust you. I want to be a Jonathan. I don't want to be the guy that waits for somebody else to, well, let's just kind of, let's not, you know, push this thing. Let's not rush. Let's just kind of hang back and, you know, it's pretty comfortable under this pomegranate tree. Let's just kind of check it out. For, let's pray about it. Let's pray about it first. See. Can I just roll? Just keep, keep, will you give me just a couple more minutes? What are you going to say? No, right? <laughs> just give me two more minutes. I just want to share this with you. I, I hadn't planned on it, but I was thinking about when the Lord was leading us to leave the comfort of our pomegranate tree on the mainland <laughs> and come here into this battlefield and to plant this church here. And I remember one time I was, I was sharing with a guy that I just really sensed that, you know, if the Lord is in this, I'm willing to, you know, just follow the lead and just trust him and just little things, you know, he'd show me a little narrow passageway as it were and just little things I would see the fingerprints of the Lord and, and so I would just keep walking by faith, just trusting him and, and I knew it wasn't going to be easy. It was steep, sharp rocks high cost of living, most expensive place in the United States of America to possibly live in. And so I knew I had all of these obstacles and the insurmountable odds. And I remember telling this brother, I said, you know what? Like Esther, if I perish, I perish. And my wife was like my armor bearer. She's like, I, I'm with you. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> was why. No, she wasn't that reluctant, actually. But boy, I tell you, we, we were seeking the Lord, man. We were really seeking the Lord. Here's the thing. I'm so glad I did. Because had I waited, just kind of played it safe. Let's not, you know, rush into anything. And, you know, it's just kind of, well, then God would have found another Jonathan. And somebody else would be the pastor of this wonderful church. <laughs> and not me. I can't even imagine that. I can't, that's unthinkable to me. Somebody else would have the privilege of being the pastor of this amazing church. God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's looking for Jonathans. He's looking for men and women who will simply say, you know what? Here am I. Send me. Listen, what have you got to lose? live on the edge, man. You know, you'll, you'll have the time of your life. You'll hang on for dear life to those sheer pointy sharp rocks on both sides, but boldly trusting God, not waiting for somebody else to. And then when you see that it's safe, hey, the victory, this is a sure thing, then send me here am I, Lord. And it's kind of like the Lord saying, yeah, too late. <laughs> I already sent somebody who was willing to walk by faith. I want to be a Jonathan. I think you do too. Why don't you stand, we'll pray.
Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for this man and his armor bearer, too. It just, Lord, is a much-needed reminder for us here tonight how it is that you're looking for men and women like this that just have that bold confidence in you, that reliance upon you. Lord, thank you for including the details of this battle in the canon of Scripture so that all of these generations later we could learn of it and learn from it. Lord, thank you. Will you take it from here now? Will you begin that process in the power of the Holy Spirit to assimilate this into our lives, apply this to our lives, that we might be men and women of faith, courageous, walking by faith. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.